Okay, so I think we can get started. Um, I'm Brenda Elsie. I am a professor in the history department and I co-direct Latin American and Caribbean studies with Professor San Pedro. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. We're really honored and excited um, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Yomaida Figueroa. Dr. Figueroa's uh, title for today is Intimacies to Apocalypso, Relations Across the Afro-Atlantic. Dr. Figueroa is Associate Professor in the English Department at Michigan State University, and perhaps better said from her own bio, um, Associate Professor of Global Af Afro-Diaspora Studies, um, which seems like an apt, an, an apt title as well. Um, Dr. Figueroa received her PhD from Berkeley in Ethnic Studies in 2014 and is author of Decolonizing Diasporas, which um, is also published 2020, yes, um, 2020 from Northwestern, um, Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature. Um, for students uh, and community members and colleagues, if you can have your camera on, um, I would really appreciate it just to create a sense of welcome and community and, and show our appreciation. I understand not everyone can do that, but please, 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 if you can do. And um, without further ado, um, thank you very much for coming, Dr. Figueroa. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be talking with you all. Um, and I hope that um, you know, we can have a good conversation after this. I know that we have like undergrads here, we have students, we have faculty, we have staff. And so I'm gonna pitch this talk to the students and hopefully everyone will, um, will enjoy that and just feel free to relax, um, you know, have your lunch, do whatever you need to do uh, and just get in. I just finished teaching right now. So um, I, I know the feeling of just having to be on camera the whole time. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna be sharing some, of my slides and actually you guys can turn off your cameras for now because I won't be able to see you but then if you can turn them on for Q&A that would be amazing because I hate talking into the void you know so I'm going to share my screen so just be free <laughs> um and let me do this real quick and present this um and actually I should have done something else sorry real quick sorry one second let me get myself um I'm going to pin myself so that way it's a little bit easier uh, and I think the recording might, it might do a little bit better for the recording. I'm not sure. Um, and we, sorry, y'all. The sharing thing is really a bit intense. Okay. So this is a talk today, Intimacies to Apocalypso. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation, Benita. Um, you know, you have with you one of the formal scholars of Equitoganian um, literature and history with your university. So it is like an honor for me to be able to be in conversation with you all um, about this work that links Spanish-speaking Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to the Spanish-speaking Caribbean diaspora. Um, I usually like to start my talks by giving a bit of an overview of myself and who I am and how I came to the work. I find it to be extremely important um, as a professor, as a researcher, as a thinker, as a scholar, um, as an organizer um, to, to be really open about how I got to the place that I am. So my name is Abbas Jumaira Figueroa Vasquez, um, and I'm an associate professor at Michigan State University. Um, I am from Puerto Rico. My parents are from Caguas and from Baja. I was born and raised in Hoboken, New Jersey. So right, very close to where y'all are at. Um, so you can see on one of the photos is a picture of Hoboken from the back end, taken from the, from the vantage point of Jersey City. Um, so you see the, the projects and then you can see the way that Hoboken is one square mile town faces, uh, you know, lower Manhattan. Um, when I was growing up in Hoboken, it was very different than what it is now. I think one of the important things to know, and this is what I've been working on recently, is that um, Hoboken in the 1970s through the early 1980s, had the highest per capita population of Puerto Ricans anywhere. So Puerto Ricans made up about one fourth of the population of the town itself. Um, and so there is a way in which that world view, uh, these ethics, um, just the way that I understood uh, knowledge and thinking and, and philosophy, all these things came from this kind of experience of growing up in the diaspora. I'm also a first generation high school graduate, the first person in my family to graduate from high school. My sister and I graduated from high school. My parents 
studied up to the third grade and the eighth grade respectively. Um, and so for them, it was really important. Uh, education was really important, even as they didn't really know how to guide me, right? Um, I went to Rutgers as an undergraduate, kind of through the skin of my teeth. I got to Rutgers where I studied English, Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies and women's and gender studies. From there, I went on um, to get my master's and my PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and I got my MA and my PhD from the Ethnic Studies Department, which was really incredible experience for me. And I can talk about that in, in, in the Q&A, why Ethnic Studies was so important for me in my formation as a, as a person and, and as, a, as a scholar. Um, the photos that you see here are my parents. So um, what's really interesting is that I didn't notice this until much later, but the photos that I chose with my parents is one with my father at my first grade graduation. Um, and you know they were just so proud. And then the second one, my, my father had passed away while I was getting my PhD. But the second photo is with my mother at my PhD graduation in, in California. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of frame that because I think even though this project that I'm doing is not necessarily about me or my family, it's not necessarily about Puerto Rico only or Puerto Rican diaspora only, I really truly believe that there's no such thing as like objectivity in research. Um, I think that that is just a sham. I think oftentimes, you know, what we think about as universal, um, you know, ideas or objective ideas are usually just Eurocentric ideas, right? Um, and so for me, it's been really important to think about what are the ways that I've been shaped by the people I know and the places I've been. And I think it's important for y'all to think about that too. Um, how you know what things are real, what things are true, what things are important, right? Um, and, and oftentimes when we come from different kinds of backgrounds and we go into the academy, what we know, what we believe, you know, um, is shaped by who we are and it's different than the values maybe of the academy itself. And I think it's important for us to hold on to that. So I'm gonna move on from here and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the book, which is Decolonizing Diasporas, Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature. This is just like a general slide that shows you some of the things that I take up in the book, including Rumba Santeria, looking at displacement, dispossession, um, looking at islands, looking at visual art, um, and it's mostly a literary literary text. In this book, what I do is I was really interested in connecting and thinking about the long relationship between the Spanish speaking Caribbean diaspora. So looking at specifically black people from Cuba, Afro Puerto Ricans, Afro Cubans, Afro Dominicans in the diaspora in relationship to Equatorial Guinea, which is the only Spanish speaking nation state in Sub-Saharan Africa and looking at the works produced in exile and in diaspora in Spain and trying to figure out what would it be like if we had conversations between black peoples, particularly between black Atlantic, Atlantic subjects, Afro-Atlantic subjects with one another outside of the purview of kind of dominant narratives, right? What would it mean for um, for folks who were uh, previous colonies of Spain, who experienced um, imperial um, uh, kind of interest and dispossession, um, who are uh, faced with these kind of long legacies of disenfranchisement, dispossession, right? Um, uh, colonialism and all of its attending violences to talk to each other, right? To be put in conversation with each other. And part of this project was really trying to um, to put together what uh, Silvio Torres Sanya and Ramon Hernandez, who are two Dominican study scholars, what they say in their book, The Dominican Americans, they say in that book that if Latinos, um, and they're writing this in the late 90s, so if Latinos are marginal, then Dominicans are peripheral to that margin. So if they're like marginal, then Dominicans are on the periphery or the outside of that margin. And that really uh, struck uh, according to me. And I think that that has changed recently because there's so many amazing work in Dominican studies, but I still think that thinking about the periphery of the margin has become so important um, because we know that, for example, um, Afro-Latinidad has, has, you know, as even as it's coming into the popular imagination and coming into like popular culture and we're looking and we're seeing folks who are mobilizing around Afro-Latinidad, we've known that historically, um, ideas of mestizaje in Latin America, right? This kind of racial, these myths of racial democracy have erased the fact that uh, Black and Indigenous Latinx folks um, have faced, right? Extreme forms of racial discrimination um, uh, and, and all kinds of disenfranchisement, right? Um, and that also goes towards their cultural productions, not just their like social and political lives, um, but also towards the kinds of work that they produce in the world. Um, and so really they fall outside, right, of so many of our conversations and our discourses around quote unquote Latinidad, right? Um, when we're thinking about blackness and indigeneity. 
And similarly in Equatorial Guinea, one of the things that we see is because it is, you know, a, a Spanish speaking nation state as the lingua franca, like the everyday language, um, uh, although it does have, you know, I'll talk a little bit later on about the kinds of ways that it is uh, quite distinct. Um, it is surrounded by Francophone and Anglophone and Lusophone nations, people who are speaking French, Portuguese, and English, right? The literatures of the continents, um, you know, are, are primarily, um, and this is like, it's been part of a very long debate around what is African literature, right? Um, and this actually, that's how I even got into the project by thinking about the languages of Af African literature. But oftentimes the literature of Equatorial Guinea, because it's in Spanish, is not necessarily thought of as part of the African canon and of literature, right? It falls out of even its own uh, geographical space as part of it. And because a lot of the literature is produced in Spain um, and produced in, in Spanish, um, you know, you would imagine that it becomes part of the Spanish letters, but in fact, it doesn't necessarily become part of the Spanish canon either, right? Um, it is necessarily thought of as, you know, uh, African literature, literature, even, even if it is produced by formal colonial subjects. And so I was really thinking about the periphery of the margin and what would it mean for us to take two peripheralized perspectives and put them together, right? How would they illuminate for us certain kinds of preoccupations, certain modes and think, modes and ways of thinking about um, violence, colonialism, but also thinking about like liberation, love, intimacy, all these other ways of, of being in the world. Um, and so for me, this is how I uh, began to shape this project. And so one of the things that uh, you see here, and I wanted to uh, bring this kind of close up map, the map, on the one side that shows the islands of, of Cuba, Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic and Haiti and Puerto Rico is one that we might be more familiar with, right? It is, you know, on our side of the hemisphere um, and the Caribbean basin is one in which we might be more attuned to seeing. Um, on, the other, on the other side, we see uh, the map of Equatorial Guinea. And these are maps that my graduate student made for me, um, thank goodness, because I was, I was failing very hard at making these maps. Um, and what we see here is, you know, Equatorial Guinea as being part of the continent of Africa, right? Like a small swath. And then we see a large island, Bioko. We see these smaller islands, Elobe Chico, Elobe Grande, Corisco. And then all the way at the bottom, we see Anabon, the kind of farthest island away. And that becomes part of one of the analyses of one of my chapters. Um, and thinking about geography and thinking about islands. I also, you know, was so intrigued when I was reading the literature of Equatorial Guinea and thinking about the ways that the islands and waters became such an important part of their imagination, right? Of the imaginary of these writers and thinkers and the ways that their literature was also a way to document history. Same with, you know, the Cuba, Haiti, I mean, Cuba, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, right? Um, thinking about, um, thinking about the ways that islands uh, become such an important part of the, the diasporic imagination. And what it made me think about, and, you know, one of the kinds of things that I attended to in my book was thinking about the archipelago. Um, and thinking about islands, right? These kind of multiple island formations. And one of the images that's in my book is this map, which I was able to reproduce from this other book that's called New York Nonstop Metropolis. And it is um, an atlas of New York City. Um, and it shows the islands um, as uh, kind of depicted geographically different in the way. So one of the maps, for example, is a map of all the New York City subway stops, um, but the stops, instead of having the names of the stops, they have the names of all the famous women who lived off that stop, right? So this is one of the maps and it's called Of Islands and Other Mothers. And this is a map of New York City, the islands of New York City, put together with the islands of the Caribbean, right? To create this kind of meta archipelago. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting and one of the reasons that I wanted to reproduce this map in my book is because in Latinx studies, it has long been you know, part of our framework to think about New York, Miami, Chicago, and points beyond as extensions of the Caribbean by virtue of the large migrations, right, to the global north, to these metropoles, right? Um, and so, for example, we have more Puerto Ricans living in the United States now than on the island itself. Dominicans, right, are the largest, like, um, ethnic group in New York. Um, surpassing Puerto Ricans a few years ago, right? And so what would it mean for us to rethink and remap based on things like migration, geography, population, right? And so for me, thinking about this project of these places that are likewise islands made me um, consider this as part of some of the work in the kind of turn of archipelago studies in Latinx studies, broadly speaking, right? Um, while also bringing in Africa uh, into the conversation. 
So one of the ways that I like tried to develop this pattern. So I had this idea. I wanted to put, bring these literatures together. I was trying to think of like, um, what were the most ethical ways that I could do it? What would be a way that I could put, um, you know, I could justify this project, but also make sure that I wasn't erasing folks' experiences, making sure that I was, um, you know, truly um, engaging in some of the kind of liber liberatory contexts um, and and like pushes that they were making us that they were making us think about, right? The way that I thought about literature itself, right? Um, and I'll talk. I think I can talk about that a little bit in the Q and A, um, particularly for folks who are doing work with literature or also like mixed projects that are like have some literature, poetry, whatever, but also have other disciplines or other things um, like history or sociology, you know, etc. So. One of the things for me that was a guide, like an ethical guide for me, was decolonial feminisms. And so I have two quotes here, um, and part of them are from my book and, and some other things that I've written. So decolonial feminisms have sought to think through and beyond the ways that colonial hierarchies of the human seek to fragment peoples categorically, and instead find ways to engage within difference and to find what uh, philosopher Maria Lugones calls possible companions in resistance, right? So I think about this, and so I'll just break this down. So one of the ways that we can understand, for example, the way that colonization engages difference is through a hierarchy, right? So colonization sees difference and it says, sees, uh, you know, a Spaniard, it sees an indigenous person, it's like, okay, this is not just a difference. This is a difference that has a particular kind of value. So the Spaniard has this value, the indigenous person has this value. So, right, it creates differences into hierarchies and then you can populate that category, right? Um, uh, indefinitely with all the kinds of differences between humans and animals, right? Racial, bodily, sexual difference, all these kinds of differences become hierarchies rather than thinking through and across differences, right? Um, and so decolonial feminism seeks to go beyond those kind of colonial differences, that hierarchy, and try to figure out how to find companions in resistance that are also different than you, right? Um, and then Laura Perez, Perez argues that a decolonizing politics must introduce, engage, and circulate previously unseen, marginalized, and stigmatized notions of spirituality, philosophy, gender, sexuality, art, or any other category of knowledge and existence. And for me, I was thinking, okay, so one of the things that I'm thinking about is the differences between these places and how to make sure that I don't engage in these differences as hierarchies. Check. Okay, how do I, you know, th the other part of the, the project that made sense to me was like, okay, I'm looking at this very, um, marginalized, previously unseen or not often seen uh, literature, right? That reflects spirituality, philosophy, gender, sexuality. It reflects all these things. Um, and I was like, okay, check. This is a project that kind of is aligned within these politics. And then I was thinking through women of color and black feminist thought, right? As a guiding, as a guiding force, right? As a guiding ethics towards thinking about this. And so we have Audre Lorde here, and this is some of the uh, some of the ways that she thinks, and also Shonda Mahansi thinks about uh, relationality as a lifetime pursuit. So Audre Lorde argues that the future of our earth may depend upon the ability of all women to identify and develop new definitions of power and new patterns of relating across difference. We have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equal. And because of this, we stand to be fractured from one another and from ourselves. So she argues that the project of relations, right, to create relations with other people across our differences is a lifetime pursuit and one that women of color have kept alive as a politics and, a, uh, and as a politics and a political practice, right? Um, and when I'm talking about women of color, I'm not talking about the kind of like whitewashed, versions of women of color that we see floating around on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. I'm talking about the radical politics that developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s around women of color, Black, Latina, Asian, Indigenous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, coming together, understanding themselves as third world women, right? And engaging in radical politics of learning each other's histories and trying to figure out how they can fight at the quote unquote edge of each other's battles, right? How they can form coalitions together across the differences of language, race, migration, sex, class, sexuality, right? Um, and to uh, create these coalitions, right? So um, this project of relationality is a methodology of complex coalition building, of learning each other's histories, and understanding of, of why differences fragment communities in search of liberation, right? And so then I have here a quote by Shana Mahanti that says, it is not color or sex that constructs the grounds for these struggles, rather it is the way that we think about race, class, gender, and the political links we choose to make among and between our struggles. 
And so for me, the question of relationality and the ways that it was not only thought about, but embodied in the personal, the political, and the cultural practices of these women of color became such an important model for me as I was thinking about the Latinx, the, you know, Afro-Latinx Caribbean diasporas and Equatorial Guinea and its diasporas, right? I also thought a lot about difference, right? How can I, how can I um, do this project that is, that is taking up four different, arguably four different places, if not more, right? Six, right? When we think about the diaspora and endpoints beyond and more, um, and say like, I'm going to create a, a project that relates them. How can I do that if I'm not attending to the differences? And so for me, this is why um, a project of relationality was so important rather than something like a comparison, like a one-to-one -one comparison. Because one of the things that I had to take up and one of the things I talk about in the book, and I don't have the slide here because it's, uh, it's very verbose and I just figured I would explain it to you, um, is that I had to think about the fact that in Equatorial Guinea, while it might be an African nation state, it's also a place that has multiple ethnic groups, multiple indigenous languages, right? Multiple histories, um, multiple islands, right? And so, yes, we can talk about it from our position here in the US and be like, oh yeah, it's African literature. It's this one thing, right? It's this one monolith. But in reality, um, the when we actually are thinking ethically about a project in decolonial context and thinking about relationality as understanding differences, but not only that, like trying to dig into the differences and trying to see, you know, where you can connect and where you collide, that becomes important. So for me, it was really important in the project to be able to say like, okay, well, in Equatorial Guinea, you know, these literatures are produced, but there's a difference if they're produced. And this is something that was very important. That was the lesson that I got from Benita, right? Um, something that she wanted to call my attention to, um, which was, you know, thinking about, okay, so if it's Fang, it's in the way, it's Bubi, it's Anawanez, like all of these different literatures represent different kinds of um, ethnic hierarchies, power struggles, right, um, within the nation state. However, I also had to attend to the fact that once that literature leaves that place where this is understood as part of the culture, like when the literature has moved to Spain, then it doesn't like, it's, in someone in Spain is not gonna pick up the novel, right? Or someone in the US not gonna pick up the novel and be like, oh, this person is from this ethnic group, right? They'll be like, oh, this is an Equatorian literature. Like this is from an African literature, right? Um, we're not necessarily trying to attend to the differences. So for me, part of that was building up a framework that I call the critical cartographies of racialization and trying to understand that um, there's these shifts in the ways that you are, the way that you experience yourself and also how you experience race, racialization, racism, depending on where you move to. And that's also true for the Spanish speaking Caribbean, right? Um, and the ways that we understand and are interpolated into both mestizaje, right? This kind of idea is like, we're all mixed, we're all three races, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what race you are because we're all Cuban or we're all Dominican or we're all Puerto Rican, that doesn't matter. And then you come to the United States, right? And, and the, but at the same time, in, in the Caribbean, you still have um, racism as part of our everyday languages and practices, right? Um, and then you come to the United States and then we have hypo descent, right? And so how do you negotiate across these different um, racial ideologies and landscapes, right? And so for me, it was really important to kind of hold on to those differences as I was analyzing the text. So relationality is not just about connection. It's also about assessing and looking at the differences so that you don't have like a super simple project that doesn't attend to like where these relationships kind of fall apart or where they don't see each other, right? Okay, so um, that's just kind of a bit of a framework about relationality and thinking about you know, how, how I started to think about the project. And I can talk later in q and if you want me to tell you the story of how I started to get into this literature. Um, but this is some of the text that I take up in the book itself. Um, and what I'm gonna do now, you know, the, the, um, the title of this talk is called Intimacies to Apocalypse Though. And the reason why is because chapter one of the book is Intimacies and chapter five is Apocalypse Though. So I'm gonna take you through how I started to think about these uh, these works, like what was the guide, like the guide for me of getting through the works. And so I'm gonna go really quickly through um, the chapter breakdown and how I got to those places and what were the kind of main themes, right? When I'm talking about like, I was interested in how the this African literature and this Caribbean literature in the diaspora were talking to each other around similar themes. I'm gonna talk to you about what those themes are. Um, and then we can have our twinning. So I just talked to you about relations, that's the introduction to the book. So I talked to you a little bit about how I get to the work, the mapping, archipelagos, relationality, decolonial feminisms, women of color feminist radical politics. And in the first chapter of the book, I look at intimacies and I look at the ways that the intimacy of coloniality, AKA looking at the intimacy of like US occupation in the Dominican Republic, looking at the intimacy of dictatorship, 
and looking at the intimacy of like ongoing forms of gender violence even after colonization is over, right? What we call the coloniality of gender, right? This, this gender violence still remains, right? In, in the lives um, uh, of, of women and girls in particular. And so in this chapter, I look at uh, Nelly Rosario's Song of the Water Saints, Trifonia Melivia Abono's La Bastarda, and then also Juan Tomas Avila Laurel's Al de Monte de Noche. And in that chapter, I trace the ways that the kind of these kinds of intimacies of US occupation and dictatorship and ongoing forms of gender violence um, and this kind of um, rejection of, of queer subjectivity, particularly looking at gay and lesbian life, right? Um, become both spaces of violence, but also spaces of liberation. And in that chapter, I track the way that um, black women and girls and black femmes are able to create um, and embody forms of liberation through um, what Nadia Stella Salgado calls corporeal consciousness or la conciencia corporal, right? And also what Jessica Marie Johnson calls black femme freedom as these practices that allow you to step in the fray from one another, that allow you to um, uh, reject some of the dominant uh, roles that have been given to you as a subject. And so in those novels, I look at the way that, you know, in one of the novels, it is like a multi-generational family of black Dominican women in the Dominican Republic and all the way into you know New York City the diaspora, all the way to the like early 2000s, um, are like living and surviving through U.S. occupation, then dictatorship, at the same time that the kind of the matriarch, the 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 mother, right, if, uh, if matriarch if you could call her that, um, decides that she is not going to live the limited life that has been given to her by virtue of being born black and peasant you know, and woman, right? Um, similarly, in one of the novels from Echo Story Guinea, we, it's the first, you know, LGBTQ novel that kind of puts at the forefront the impossibilities of being, you know, a fang lesbian woman um, from Equatorial Guinea, right? And looking at the ways that, you know, they have to both negotiate the kind of ways that they are not named as lesbian, right? So one of the ways that the author frames it is like, in our language, in the fang language, there's no such thing as a word for lesbian, right? And so because of that, like, even the act of my existing um, is not um, is not here and is being fought against. And the ways that she finds um, particular forms of freedom um, through escaping, right? This kind of acts of maronage, right, um, into the forest and and with her with her uh, gay uncle, with his partner, um, and with the kind of collective of other um, kind of wayward queer people. Um, and for me, it is really interesting to look at the ways that this kind of embodied liberation, right? This kind of corporeal consciousness that is really kind of um, pulled up through sexuality um, becomes like a marker for finding freedom in unfree spaces, right? Um, and so I ask in that chapter, after I, I looked at those three novels, I asked, you know, if all these things are happening in this literature, like if so much stuff is popping off, right? Like we have all these things happening. Um, who is seeing this? Are, are we reading literature just for pleasure? Are we reading it just for like, aesthetics, like, oh, that was nice, that was good, that was bad, on board, or that was, you know, pleasurable or not pleasurable, or are we reading it for the kinds of messages that they're giving us, for the kinds of ways that they're asking us to attend to uh, insurgent histories, for the ways that they're asking us to, um, to pay attention, right, and to think differently about our lives and about the world, and so I ask in that chapter, you know, if this is happening in the, in the, in the literature, who's, who's witnessing this, who's seeing this, which moves us into the chapter on faithful witnessing, and in that chapter, I read Juno Diaz's The Brief uh, Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, and Donatan Dongo's Shadows of Your Black Memory, Las, Memorias de tu, de, Las Tinieblas de Tu Memoria Negra, um, and in that chapter, I look at the way that, that, that witnessing um, becomes a, a kind of philosophical framework, right? So uh, that goes against kind of um, continental philo philosophical understandings of um, recognition, in particular looking at the ways that it goes against like Hegelian agonistic master-slave dialectics of recognition and looking at the way that feminists have thought of witnessing as an alternative, right? Like something that turns away from just that like back and forth of like uh, this kind of dialectic where someone will always be unseen and unheard and unrecognized to witnessing as uh, this possible way of seeing one another that is not necessarily agonistic, right? Um, and so witnessing becomes this important kind of uh, feminist philosophical um, kind of framework for thinking about bearing witness and seeing one another. And decolonial feminists take up witnessing, but beyond that, faithful witnessing. What does it mean to not just see, but also act? Right. Um, what does it mean to step in the fray for others? What does it mean um, to believe and more? 
right? Um, and so I argue that faithful witnessing is a practice that, you know, um, communities and women of color have had since time immemorial. Um, and that faithful witnessing is what happens when you don't collude with oppression, right? When you don't collude with kind of powers that try to limit or mitigate other people's lives, right? And so for me, um, faithful witnessing, I look at it in the chapter through two lenses. One is kind of like this kind of juridical um, lens and a religious lens. And then the other one is looking at the ways of gender violence and looking at the ways that um, the coloniality of gender, this ongoing gender violence, even that, that like stems from colonialism, but that remains after, you know, the colonial administrations have gone, um, how they remain as part of the lives of people and of the, of the kind of um, actions that people take against one another. And so I look at the ways that the authors are bearing witness to the kind of violence of colonization through both juridical lenses and religious lenses, and then look at the ways that authors are bearing witness to gender violence, right? And I argue that faithful witnessing is not just like, you know, the authors bearing witness in the book. It is also us as scholars and thinkers reading literature and not just taking it up as aesthetic or as pleasure, but also taking up our role, our ethical role and our political role as as critics, as thinking, as, as scholars, to look at the literature and bear witness to what is being put on the page. And more than that, um, faithful witnessing is not just this hermeneutic practice, not just a scholarly practice, but it's also a practice that we could take up in our everyday lives. What does it mean for us to bear witness to one another um, in, in these very important political moments? And we're in some very important political moments. And we could think about the connections to, for example, right now, um, the Derek Chauvin trial, when he murdered George, George Floyd, and we have these people on the stand, right? witnessing, witness, witnesses, right, to his murder. We have, you know, this material like video witnessing, but more than just a video, right, more than just this footage, we need people to speak up and step out, right? Um, so for me, it becomes really important the implications of what witnessing means for us in, in relationships to justice um, and how witnessing and just seeing alone is not enough, but acting in addition to that becomes important. So in that chapter, I argue that if witnessing is so important, and it is such an important part of decolonization as a, as a project of decolonization or project of liberation, then what is the first thing that we need to be witness, bearing witness to? And I argue that it is this thing called destierro. And destierro is one of the untranslatable words for exile in Spanish. Um, exile in Spanish is exilio, and it also is destierro. And destierro means to be forcefully torn from the earth, right? To be forcefully torn from from the dirt, from the ground, from a home, right? Um, and so for me, this was uh, really evocative and it came from reading, it came again from a novel itself, this word and the kind of, the characters really struggling with being torn away from their homelands. And I started to think about the ways that modern colonialism and um, <laughs> capitalism, right? As, as it develops in the long 16th century um, is contingent on this possession. It's contingent on tearing peoples away from their homes and homelands and then tearing other people's away from their homes and humans and moving them onto the dispossessed lands of others. So we can think about the kind of foundational violence of indigenous dispossession, um, of, of African enslavement, of genocide, right? As part of this long project of the theater that then allows um, for the accumulation of capital, right? And the continual accumula accumulation of capital, we can think about the different ways that that takes up in terms of like buying land, dispossessing people of their homes and lands, um, gentrification, right? Like all these kinds of ways we move people out of the spaces that they might call home. And so for me, this theater became an important way for me to look at um, both uh, the kind of phenomenological and the kind of subjective, right? Like the kind of like general experience of us within the world and also our own personal experiences um, of this data being torn away um, from homes, homelands, languages, practices. And so in this chapter, I look at Loida Marita Perez's Geographies of Home, as well as Juan Tomas Avila Laurel's El Dictador de Corisco. And in that chapter, I look at the way that this Tierro in one novel, particularly the Dominican novel, it looks at the way that this year is gendered and racialized and it looks at the way that anti-blackness right this kind of rejection of blackness rejection of afrosyncratic practices of spirituality um become uh one of the ways that the theater takes hold in a family um and that they're 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 clung back to those practices become some of the way that they some of the ways that they save themselves and one another right um and so i look at the kind of ways that anti-blackness 
creates a spaces for people to want to reject that which is their inheritance, right? Um, and then the moment that they remember these things, um, it, it becomes such an important part of how they can move forward. Um, that chapter is like super, super intense. Um, and I, I would love to talk about it if y'all want to talk about it. But then the other part of that chapter is looking at this novel, Dictado de Corisco, and it is, it is a very short novel, kind of urgent novel, and it is about a family, and it is about the the kind of um, impact of remembering, right? Like how remembering practices are also deadly and dangerous. And in both of these novels, we see that um, Destierro is um, becomes uh, not only are you subject to being torn away from your home and homelands, but that these kind of colonial powers and orders and neo-colonial powers and orders want you to also forget where you come from, right? And so the act of remembering the past, remembering history become these kind of deadly, um, uh, these deadly and kind of uh, potentially uh, violent, right, uh, things, right? So we have this kind of pushing away of memories um, in the uh, now from, from, uh, from Equatorial Guinea, we see an actual physical tearing away from the homeland and a resistance to that. For me, it became important to think about the theater not only as it comes up in the novel, but also as a political practice, because even though we have this theater, right, we have this tearing away from people for over 500 years from their land, land-based practices, languages, spirituality, et cetera, we also have had constant resistance to that, right? Constant resistance um, and constant resurgence of practices and languages um, and understandings of ourselves in the world. And so for me, this theater is not just the negative, but the other side of that is the ways that people continue to enact, right? Um, these connections to, to the land and to places and to homes. Um, and so I have in that chapter a quote from Jackie Alexander, where she talks about the fact that, you know, it is one thing to say that you remember the land, right? Rocks hold memory, land holds memory. And she says, but it's another thing to say that the land remembers you back. She says, water will call you by your ancient name and you will not have forgotten because water always remembers, right? So what does it mean then when we not only make claims to the land, but also understand that the land claims us back? This theater for me was not only about this, but it's also about understanding other people's dispossession. And for me, this became really important. Um, one of the ways that I entered this conversation was thinking about, okay, I'm a black woman, I'm a black Puerto Rican woman, I'm a colonial subject of the United States because Puerto Rico is still a colony of the United States. I'm also a US citizen, right? And so there are all of these levels of, of lived experience and the ways that we identify politically um, and, and culturally. Um, but then I also am get to live and produce work on this land. And this land is, you know, Anishinaabe lands. It's Ojibwe land, Potawatomi land, Odawa land, where I'm at, right? And the other thing is, is that the university that I work for is not just a land grant university. It is the first land grant university in the United States, right? It prides itself um, as being this kind of um, kind of flagship for future land grant, right? Which is like acquisition of land. And when my university was built, there were indigenous encampments all across, right? All around the river that cuts to the middle of campus. And these communities were removed for the expansion of the place that now I teach. And so for me, it became really important so I don't really sit with my own history of dispossession of this tierra, but also to think and to act alongside folks who are working towards, you know, immatriation of lands, um, indigenous sovereignty, right? Um, and to think specifically, even in place, like how do I align myself with American Indian Indigenous Studies on campus with the kinds of work that they do? Um, how do I step in, right, ethically into this conversation, not only thinking about my own destierro, but also the destierro of others? I argue that this kind of conversation, this political conversation around destierro, leads us to think about reparations. What does reparations look like when it's not only about money, right? So like, what does it mean, reparations, when you can say like, I've done this damage to you, I've calculated that it is approximately $5,000 and now I never want to hear about this damage that I did to you again, right? Is that really repair, right? And so in the chapter on reparations, I take up what I call the reparation of the imagination. How do we understand reparations across the different experiences of dispossession of destierro that we have experienced um, as people under the heel of colonialism, but also um, how do we engage in a reparation of the imagination? And in that chapter, I look at Ernesto Quinones' Bodega Dreams, as well as Joaquin Bobby Bachang's Matinga Sangre de la Selva, taking up two completely different understanding the reparation. One, reparation in Sangre de la Selva, in Matingas, uh, in the novel Matinga is about blood, literally natalism, reproducing, like repairing the nation through the, through the birthing of children, right? Um, both in a kind of um, meta metaphorical sense, but also in one that privileges the kind of continuation of people, right, as resistance. 
and the other one looking at you know Spanish Harlem in New York City and gentrification and looking at the ways that reparation works on two levels one in like uh, engaging in the same kinds of practices that um, corrupt city officials have long worked in and buying buildings and putting in Puerto Rican and Latino families at the same time that that, that model of reparations is contingent on selling drugs, right? And on um, basically gutting um, the, this population of young people who then are strung out, right? What emerges out of there is what I argue is this kind of decolonial love um, when the kind of protagonist is seeing the flaws in creating a reparations that is exactly the same as the kinds of structures that are already there. Um, and what happens is um, there's this moment where he is understanding that his the, a different kind of form of reparation is this, this connection to other people, right? Taking in others, understanding the other, right? Um, and so for me, I am interested in the way that they, how these, these writers and these thinkers are asking us to conceive differently about reparations. And it's not that monetary reparations are not necessary. I like to think about this, you know, monetary re reparations and then what? If we don't actually understand and remap our relationships with one another, um, one of the things that, that may happen and continues to happen is the kind of fighting of people at the bottom, right, with one another, right? And so how do we remap these reparations and this kind of repertory feature um, together? Um, and so that takes me to the chapter Apocalypso where it's cut into two parts. One of them is looking at spirituality, Santeria, Lukumi, uh, specifically looking at um, Ibeyi, the Afro-Cuban French twins um, who are singers um, uh, and artists, um, and Daniel uh, Jose Older's Shadow Shapers. And in those two um, uh, works, I'm looking at music videos and music lyrics, and then looking at this young adult novel, and I'm mapping the way that they are breaking with like colonial temporality and spatiality through this practice of, of Lukumi and Santeria that engages with ancestors in the present and as a way to understand and map their futures, right? Um, and I argue that the ways that they can see these kind of everlasting practices, right? Um, spiritual practices um, become an apocalypse. They end the kind of colonial logics and orders, right? Um, that would say that the dead are dead, that you know, not only are your ancestors gone, but they were like not important because they were black or indigenous, right? But in fact, that the constant loving on, um, lauding to the rumbas that are dedicated to the dead, the bringing, you know, saying that you know you are your santos and your santos, are, you know, yo soy mi santos y mi santos soy yo, right? Um, the kind of movida um, to not only bring them in as an essential part of your present, but to say like that the ancestors are such an important part of your future break away from the logic that would say like that black life didn't matter in the past and it doesn't matter in the future. The second part of that chapter looks at um, a short story, Monstro, as well as a novel called Pangarilena that looks at literally the end of worlds as it's coming out of Dominican and Equatoguinean contexts. Um, and looking at they, these, both of these texts, interestingly enough, um, conjure up a disease, a blackening disease, right? That is the beginning of the end of worlds. And I look at the ways in which um, these folks are looking at the end of modernity as a boomerang effect, right? All of the things that have that have been inflicted upon um, Black and Indigenous peoples um, come back, right, um, to modernity to kind of uh, uh, end this world. Um, and then I end the book with a short coda, and um, which is basically a conclusion where I look at the sea, and in that chapter I look at the poetry of Raquel Lom del Pose Pita, um, and then I also look at the poetry of Araceli Sirmay who is the uh, uh, Eritrean, African-American and Puerto Rican poet. And then I also look at the artwork, the visual artwork that you see in the cover of the book, um, Maria Magdalena Campos Ponce is an Afro-Cuban um, installation artist. And I look at the way that the sea comes up throughout the book um, and the ways that some of these works touch on every single one of the topics um, that I've talked about. Overall, the book itself is like, you know, propelled forward by decolonial love. Um, and I build the, the kind of um, definition of decolonial love throughout the book itself um, by looking and, and thinking about the ways that these works prompt us to think differently about ourselves and about others. So decolonial love as future work envisaged through our past is necessarily a technology for social transformation and is a method through which we can reimagine a uh, human being as practice. Decolonial love manifests as attention to 1492, to the past before it, the past since, the subterranean roots created by it and the dead beneath the sea. It can be imagined as looking into the vast and inconsolable sea to make visible what was disappeared and make perceptible futurities beyond colonization. <laughs>
And so one of the things that I wanted to leave you with, and one of the things I realized that I didn't really mention before, was that, you know, this project of relating and this project of like decolonial love between Equatorial Guinea and the Spanish speaking Caribbean is not just something that, you know, I'm reading these books and making up, but actually there's this long legacy of connection between these places. And this project is just part of many that are illuminating more connections between Black peoples, Afro-Atlantic peoples, African peoples um, across histories. We have been so very much fractured in our memories and our histories with one another. And I feel like for me, this project was one in which I was able to bring forward um, some of the historical connections um, and then some of the kind of literary and imaginative connections and the ways that, you know, as black people um, and African people in the modern world, we do have very similar concerns, um, desires and, 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 and moves towards liberation. So um, I think I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>